Okay. Hey everyone, welcome back. Sydney and Liana, and we're here with Jackie Walker. We're so lucky. Thank you so much for being with us. So happy today. to be here. Um, so we just want to start by telling us who you are in your entirety, you know, no pressure, but, <laughs> you know, who you are, what you like, um, what you do, what matters to you, parts of your identity, anything that we need to know about you. Okay. Um, my name is Jackie Walker. Um, I am, my pronouns are she and hers. Um, I am a Pittsburgher, born and raised. Um, but I've also identified with a number of other places and that's dope. Um, I am a lawyer, an arts advocate, and cultural producer. Um, and I'm also a yoga instructor amongst the things that I do with my time and vocation. And I'm a black woman and that's awesome. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I would say like, yeah, that's, that's how I identify. Those are my experiences. I think it's a good rundown um, of what I of where I come from. What do you like to do for fun? Ah, uh, sorry, just lightening the mood a little during this. No, time. I like it. I mean, I like to do so much. I love to laugh. Like, so what this has taught me, this uh, current pandemic has taught me, is how much I love to laugh and how like how important it is to my day-to-day -day. so I'm all about anything that makes me laugh or smile which means dancing laughing I love to play tennis um because it just brings me so into my body and my body is amazing and then when you feel like oh my goodness my body is amazing then you are like I'm amazing and you keep moving on through your life um mm -hmm. and what else I don't know. I love to party. Like, I just like, like to have a good time. I like to eat. Like you name the things that lift your spirit. And I probably will be like, yeah, let's do it. Like, what are we doing? So. <laughs> yep. Same. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah, so those are my hobbies. I like to play games. I'm kind of competitive, but then the artist in me is like, nah, I'm cool. Like my expression <laughs> is fine. Like, you know, if you get it, you get it. If you know, you know. Yep. You know? Like <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So obviously our podcast is called Post-Racial. If you're watching this, you don't see that the logo, but the logo has posts scratched out for obvious reasons. Um, well, maybe not so obvious, but, <laughs> um, and we'll learn about that. But so we've been asking this question just to kind of tie everything in, but what does post-racial mean to you? You know, how does it make you feel when you hear, you know, oh, we live in a post-racial society or... Um. It sounds like the people who are usually saying it have no concept or attachment to the reality that a lot of other people live. And it seems like a great opportunity to challenge that point of view in a room so that other people can consider how are the rest of the conversation is going to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, it usually leaves me feeling like it just, it's a really good read, honestly, of who the audience is and you know how deep we're going to be able to go as far as connecting and interacting um so i think like you said for obvious reasons we should know that we don't live in a post-racial world um considering that we see vastly different outcomes for black and brown children all over this country um and honestly all over the world but definitely in this country, we're seeing vastly different outcomes, vastly different qualities of life being lived. Um, like black people are literally dying from stress, like hypertension and heart disease. Those are, that's stress. That's not like, like you can talk about diabetes all you want, but that's stress. And so when we're not being honest about what are the things that are creating that stress, mm -hmm. yes. and then to have the gall to say we live in a post-racial society, it's insulting and it's laughable. Mm -hmm. And it's the laughter that you laugh to keep from crying. So that's how I feel about 
the phrase post-racial is that, you know, it's some bull and it's important then to be the person that speaks to that, no matter how exhausting it is, to be the person that, that calls it out as not true and it's not gonna be the premise upon which we move forward in conversation and relationship. Mm -hmm. Like I will not be complicit with you in that belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that makes me think too about right now, you know, in this time, obviously there's a collective trauma, right? It, arguably a collective world trauma, which is COVID-19, just like everything is getting, woo, just no matter what kind of person you are, things are getting toppled. And there's a lot of messaging right now too that like, this is collective trauma. We all, you know, we all need to find some centering. But I'm wondering too, what you think about, you know, how does that look in terms of the differences in our identities? You know, like if you are, um, you know, a white woman or a black woman, what does that look like, you know, in terms of that, that different work that has to happen in a time like this? You know, where some people might be feeling like it's a new thing, it's because it's new to them, it took a pandemic for them to feel isolated, right, or alone, um, whereas other people have been living like that, arguably. For centuries. Centuries, yeah. So how do you, have you heard this? Has this been a thing? You know, how do you handle this kind of, you know, I've seen this on the internet, like how do you, what are you thinking about that? So I will say what's come up for me, and this was like a week one, week two thing. I, after like stressing like crazy, oh my goodness, I don't know what's going on with work. Like I came at the end of week one and just had to have a reckoning with myself. And I said, you know, you're not doing very well mentally right now. And if you don't take care of yourself and prioritize your health, then it won't matter, you know? And so I started to sit with and realize like the collective grief that's happening. And I think for a lot of people, that grief, or at least what occurred to me, that some of what I was grieving was my complicity in my own oppression. And so it really made me sit down and think about what my goals were um, as far as like, well, like, what is the point of all of this? What is the point of you going through this? And so I think that people have an opportunity to think about that. Like, how am I showing up and being a part of this thing that I know isn't working? Um, is it in how I treat people when I'm at the market? Have I just been so rude to people the whole, like, am I rude to people and really spending time becoming more self-aware? Like, did I think that I was better than, than uh, grocery store workers? Do I think I'm better than people who ride the bus? Do I think I'm better? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, because if we start to confront that within ourselves, then we start to be able to consider why didn't think about these people as human beings before and somehow worthy of protection. Like they, like everyone should have access to, everybody should have access to healthcare. Everybody should have access to like nice housing, mm -hmm. to warm housing and affordable housing at that. Like, so I think these are some of the things that have been hitting me quite a bit is not so much in those examples, but definitely more so from a place of how am I participating in this? And how is that serving me? Um, there was a lot of pressure I was putting on myself and I had to say, you're putting pressure on yourself. Nobody else is putting pressure on you. Who said they needed this in 24 hours? You're creating that situation, you know, like, so those are some of the things that I've been thinking of and that, have, that keep hitting me. It's like, if you feel stressed, how much of it is you adding to it and how much of it is the situation you're in? And I think when we think about what's going on in this world and some of the things that we have to sit down with on an individual basis, those are the questions to ask. Like, it's like, wait, how am I adding to well, how am I adding to things in a way that is harmful versus how am I adding to things in a way that may be helpful? You know, and am I taking care of myself? 
And taking care of yourself is a deeply personal thing. So regardless of whether you're a white woman or a black woman, how you take care of yourself might be different, you know, and it, it, it probably is very different, you know, and it means setting boundaries. It means using the word no. It means not being so worried about, you know, like we talk about imposter syndrome, you know, and I was struggling with that to a certain degree, but I also love the NAP ministry. <laughs> Shout out to the NAP ministry. Um, because what their founder said, what she said was um, something to the effect of, it's not imposter syndrome if you built this country. Like, that's not imposter syndrome. That's white supremacy and capitalism. Go take a nap. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that I did, and this is what's so beautiful, the first thing that I've been doing anytime I start feeling that stress is I go lay down. I don't, my rest practice started two years ago when I moved back to Pittsburgh from New York City. And I moved back here to rest. Mm -hmm. Because I realized that I, there was no way in hell I could be doing any client a solid service if I was exhausted. And if I'm exhausted, how am I in my right mind? Even if you can make good decisions, and I think that's what people don't realize, you're playing Russian roulette with good, de with good decisions mm -hmm. if you're exhausted. So I was like, no, nah, I'm gonna just go to sleep. And so I've come back to that during this time. Mm -hmm. I laid my behind down. And so I think, <laughs> Yeah, I love the Nat Ministry too. And I, I read that and I was so excited to read it. I felt so much better. And I've been thinking about, it made me think about how imposter syndrome is, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, or maybe not, maybe I'm just feeling weird about putting it in a podcast, but it's like, it felt like a very white thing. Mm -hmm. you know, it felt very much like that's something you feel when you're maybe not living fully in community and what that really means and, or you're not living fully in your truth yeah and Our, what that means yeah so you're not even in alignment with who you are and of course you're not in alignment with who you are if you're in an environment that's not supportive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so um i think some of those things are definitely a part of you know what different people are facing right now and so I think like what I think, and I also think that whatever comes up is what comes up for you. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to consider, right? Like all of the, all of the systems, you know, when I think about, you know, a person of color saying, you know, imposter syndrome, I have imposter syndrome, you know, and then, and exactly like the net, when I read that quote from the Nat ministry, I thought, oh my gosh, yeah, it's not the same. Like if you're not figuring it out. Oh, you didn't get that job. Oh, you didn't, you know, you're, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying. Mm -hmm. You know, you have so many other things that are stacked up against you. That's not imposter syndrome. That's just life. That, like, like yeah. that's your experience happening in real time. Yeah, and and that's like, exactly. <laughs> and it's like, it's even more real when you consider, you know, exactly capitalism and like, you know, racism and all these other pieces of it. You know, it's like, if I'm not hired because I'm a woman, is that, does that mean that I had, you know, imposter syndrome? No, that just means that like these other people are trash. <laughs> it's just, like they can't see these things. Like you, everybody can't see everything. So it's like, how do we not hold things for other people? You know, how do we, how do we, do like, how do you give, give people their shit back? Like, how do you give, here you go. It's like, like, here you go. Take that back. I'm gonna hold on to my shit. I did bring some shit to the party. But I'm hold on to mine. You can take yours. Um, the other I think thing it's easier though for people to to not see their shit, but take other people's shit and try to figure it out, and then just completely ignore their shit. Yeah, I feel like what you said, like you were like after the first week or two, I'm thinking about you know what the grocery store worker, but like then you're also like you know where are the ways that I'm taking care of myself and. Let's just be slightly frank here. Like, you know, it's, it's whiteness, however, but it certainly seems to be a theme that I'm white, you know, this is a podcast for people listening, but um, that it's like doing neither rather than like take care of myself and reflect on this thing in this time where I may not have been living in either my truth or I may have 
what do you, whatever you said, brushed it to the party. Like that seems like a healthy way to reflect on during this pandemic rather than like what seems to be happening in a lot of other people, other identities to share my own is like not reflect on my own and almost like double down on like whatever, go get my toilet paper, go get everything instead of like understanding this interconnectedness of everything like and everyone and not just like mm -hmm. this is a time to double down on being out for myself or my people, my family, my whatever who's in my house. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if there's a question there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to figure, I was like, I don't know what the question is, but I like the comment. <laughs> no, I don't know if it was a question. Was it a question, Sid? I mean, no. the question is like, I had. dang, how did you do that? And that's like a giant, it's a lot of emotional and like growth well, think, to a point to be doing that, maturity. And it just like, that's like your natural the space you went. <laughs> Well, I think that there's, okay, so there's like, that's like years of, that's a lifetime, right? Like, I think one of the things people don't realize is like, to be Black in America on many levels is to be like, is to have a more attuned sense of self-awareness in general. Mm -hmm. Like, I always say that know, know white people better than white people would ever know white people. You need to know, yeah, it was like, I'm not surprised when shit happens. I'm usually just like, oh, okay. You know, like, like ooh. children, right? It's like when you're a child who is hurt, you know everything that's going on around you so you could stay alive. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's like, I'm not abusive, but as a baby, you know that shit, you know. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. You kind of become aware of what of what the op of what the possibility is, right? So it's like, what's the worst case scenario? So it's like an awareness of like our bodies. I need I need to know where my body is. <laughs> I need to know where my body is in in relation to other people's bodies always for my own protection generally just for my own protection you know mm -hmm. um where what's on everything yeah so so it's like so you're thinking about that that's i think that's something that's already there and that's a great baseline to have but i also think the ethos of the community i came up in at least is there's an assumption not just that I don't have that someone might not have and you might need to be a gap filler if you have abundance then it's also that whenever like you don't you don't not ask for support if you need it because somebody else is going to be able to gap fill and resources aren't just money and toilet paper mm -hmm. like emotions and emotional support is a resource you know like love is a resource mm -hmm having the space to be with someone. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's an interconnectedness that's already exists in these communities, which have always been isolated from white life, you know, and the only reason that you start to see, not the only reason that's not fair. Um, I think the reason you, you start to see more of it on display is because more and more white people want to live in communities where black people exist. Mm -hmm. And we don't think about how there's a whole generation of young white kids, young white folk who are starting to have to be more dependent on each other mm -hmm. because of the financial situations that we've lived through as a generation. Like we've lived through a lot of shit. You mean we're not lazy ass motherfuckers? We are like brilliant ass visionary motherfuckers, right? millennials. Okay, Very so awesome. like these are the things that I think we need to be aware of. But what I will say too is, if we think about like why was it my go to 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 jump into that? It's because these things have already been working for me. You know, like before this happened. I had already been on a two year plus, probably plus, plus, plus journey of finding my own alignment, figuring out how to exist fully in my truth. Um, you know, how to be as self-expressed as humanly possible. And for that to be how I live my life. Mm -hmm. 
And was that yoga that like got you there or did you start with something else first before you kind of came into yoga practice? I think I, my yoga practice started while I was in law school. I would say like full fledged. And um, so it wasn't just yoga, but I would say doing my yoga teacher training, like going through that process really helped give me a vocabulary to describe what it is that I wanted to be doing. And you didn't just take any training, you know, it's, it's, it's specifically considered anti-racist yoga teacher training, correct? Correct. So I took, um, so I did the yoga roots on location training, which was amazing. It was an amazing experience surrounded by 30 plus women. Um, and many of them black, it was dope. Um, and the woman who leads it is Felicia Savage Friedman. Um, but I think what I loved is that the framework that it exists in is one in which we are all teachers and we're all students. And that's how I lead, you know, that is a instructor. That's how I lead mm -hmm. that. that I'm here like to learn from you. Huh? That seems like it's just a value in terms of who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know? And so I think like all of these things kind of helped create a vocabulary for me to be in a community with the women I was in community with. Um, as a result of that training, really helped me find a vocabulary to describe the world that I was trying to create for myself. Um, and I came to that place after being very dissatisfied with just, you know, it wasn't that things were terrible, right? But I knew that there was a difference between me just surviving and me thriving. And I knew that if I was going to get to the point of thriving, that I was going to need to make some changes mm -hmm. in not just external changes, such as, you know, my geographical location, so I could have more financial stability, so I could really explore and experiment and take more risk. But also, my internal world and my internal environment needed a shift mm -hmm. and how I thought about things and how I, you know, and I'm a work in progress big time. Mm -hmm, we all are. Um, but it's definitely, so I would say it's like that having, you know, therapy, therapy works wonders. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, it's so funny because I, I, you know, we should, we should talk about this a little bit more just in general, Sid, I feel like moving forward in general, like a theme, like as a question, just like, who's going to therapy? You know, I'm just like, I feel like I'm yeah. curious, you know, We've interviewed a lot of people. We continue to interview a lot of people. And, you know, ev I'm sure some of our listeners have not seen a therapist. Some people have probably seen horrible therapists or therapists that weren't right for them. And, you know, not that every therapist isn't right for you is horrible, but we all know that there's some horrible therapists out there. It's, and it's also all about, like, there, you got to have some chemistry with your therapist. Like, y'all have to, like, you have to trust that you can really speak your heart and say what's really going on in your world and that they can receive it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And do something with it. Because otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why? Mm -hmm. We're why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it took me a while. It took me a couple years to, like, work up the nerve to, like, like, so at first I was, like, working up the nerve to find a therapist. Then I started to go through the process of, you know, they say, look at your uh, insurance provider and see who's on the list. And you're like, I don't know, I'm, how am I supposed to figure that out? Yeah. Rolling through the pictures and the thing. And I was like, yeah, no. Nope. A lot of therapists don't put their picture either because they have like, you know, some people have different privacy things. And so it's really hard to get an idea of what, and I ended up finding my therapist from talking to a friend who is a therapist mm -hmm. and I said do you have any suggestions because she was like well and I'll say she was a, actually she's a friend but she's somebody who we went to college together and so we know each other we have a previous relationship and I was just kind of like you know I kind of want somebody who don't know nothing about me also um, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um and I wanted someone who was close like, I wanted somebody who, you know, was kind of in the city, and this is when I was living in Brooklyn at the time, and so I was like, I wanted somebody who was living in Brooklyn or living close by, it would be easy for me to get to them or for them to get to me, and it just so turns out that 
I met this amazing woman. My therapist is like one of my favorite humans. Like, that's great. Yay. And so yeah, and her practice is like what she does is amazing. Um, and she focused, you know, she focuses her. So my friend Toshi focuses her practice on professional black women. And so this is one of the women she mm. came up under. Mm-hmm. And so that even in and of itself created like already this kind of safe space of knowing mm-hmm. that like, okay, I'm not going to have to overly explain my relations and my like family dynamics to you. I'm not going to have to overly explain certain things. Like when I say this, you know what that means. Like, it's not like a lot of detail. And that was something that was important because what I'm getting to the depths of what I have to say is the detail. It's not all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay. You know, I think that so many, you know, this idea that there's just like that therapists, and I, and I say this realizing too, that this has been the way that therapy has been, right? This has been the expectations of therapists to just be like, you sort of all knowing general, you know, but I found that the more a therapist, you know, and I'm really grateful for where I am, you know, because something that Jody, who is, um, who owns Forward Wellness, where, where I, where I do my work out of, um, is always saying like, lean into yourself, you know, like this is, you know, there is such a thing as an ideal client, right? Just like a client has an ideal therapist. Like how can you know, you know, who we are to really do our best work? And I think that it's so important. And part of that is knowing who we are, you know, like I know what I'm good at. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I know who might be, who I might be able to really mesh with. And that's something that I wish I really would have known younger. You know, I didn't go to therapy as an adult. I started therapy, you know, I'm an adopted kid. I, I was just thrown in there, you know, playing with Barbies or something. And they're like, she told the, the, you know, she pulled the head off the Barbie. She's going to be a bad kid. I don't know. But like, <laughs> I started out like really, really, really young. So it was, it was something I didn't get. I definitely put therapists on a pedestal. So I think it's, it's awesome. You know, it makes me so happy to see when it works, you know? It help me navigate the process of deciding to leave New York and like what that looked like. It helped me and it's helped me navigate this whole transition of being back in Pittsburgh, of working through so much of my issues around being from here, why I left, why I I vowed to never return. Like there were like, (laughs) yeah, no, I get it. I did the same thing. I went to LA, I came back, I did the same thing. I was like, I'm not coming back. And also to make a, the most of it. And like, there were very clear reasons why I was happy to come back here. You know what I mean? Like it is a slower pace. It does allow me to be like a thousand things without people questioning it too deeply, mm-hmm. you know, like, and it's just because it's like, well, you're good at what you do. So why, like, I don't care. Like, that's just not the ethos here to be like, you need to do one thing really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. also Pittsburgh is so great. I'm curious what Sydney thinks about this too. Sydney is the only one here who is not from Pittsburgh, but has been Minneapolis. Minneapolis, she's from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting because I thought about this a lot coming back to Pittsburgh, but I think we're known for this because I also have found that people from other places who visit us here and kind of see us, you know, like being together, like the people that we care about, it's different. It's just like so, um, I think there's just a really beautiful depth that we're able to have in terms of family and, and chosen family. I don't necessarily just mean our, our, our families, our immediate families, our parents, our siblings, but the, the community that you're able to create in a city that is like this, that is a little slower moving, slower paced, um, lots of rich history, um, you know, lots of connection to community uh, in terms of the space, you know, the topography, uh, the history, the ancestry, there's so much here to pull from. Mm. I know Pittsburgh gets a lot of crap for like not letting um you know anybody in, but I think it's like a you know like yeah I've been here twenty years but you weren't you know from Pittsburgh or whatever but it does feel like the other side of that is pretty much what you're saying it's like taking care of and you know the people like everybody's like taking care of each other and so it's like everybody's interconnected almost like whatever. It's so corny to say that it's a small town because everybody says that about Pittsburgh, but it is like that. Like everybody knows each other so much more than cities of the same size. I don't, 
totally know how that happens. I'm going to get up and look because there's about a hundred deer in my yard right now that are about <laughs> to eat my vegetables. So one second. <laughs> but I'll also say that in that same, it was really hard for me to leave. When I left Brooklyn, I was like, yo, I have a community here. Hmm. Like I have a for real community here. Like people show up for me and I show up for people. And I realized that that's just something that like, if you're about community, it's just something that lives in you. And it's something you can't help but make mm -hmm. no matter where you go. You know, no matter where you go, no matter what you do. And so that's usually what I look for. Like I've stopped trying to be like, I need to be in this place or that place. I'm like, is there community there? Mm -hmm. You know, like I had an opportunity to, you know, I was thinking about moving back at one point and I had to make a decision last spring, right around this time. And I was like, yeah, nah, there's like an amazing community of women here who like, we're going through a similar, like I have a cohort, you know, like we're all expanding and doing and growing and evolving and we offer each other love and care and support. And I want that, like I wanna be in that soil as I grow and as I become. Cause I could tell that I was in the midst of becoming. Um, I mean, we always are, for being honest. But you know, like I think- Awareness, our awareness shifts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awareness and coming to life and coming into this vision I have for what my life could be. You know, like the work that I started doing was uh, around who was the person I always wanted to be when I was like 16? You know, who did I want to be when I was like 14? Like, who did I see myself being? Like, what did my life look like? What did my day to day look like? And it, when I was honest with myself and open with myself with what that looked like, what I envisioned my adulthood being, I was like, go do that. That was cool. <laughs> you were doing a lot, but you were happy. And so as I started to do more and honor these parts of myself that are just real and honest, um, by not just trying to prove how good a lawyer I am, right? Like, I'm a lawyer, I'm good. It's like, eh, yeah, I do that. That's cool. I also do these other things mm -hmm. and they're cool too. Mm -hmm. and you're up to a whole bunch of stuff you got a lot going on I do I've been you know I'm having a good time I'm having a good time you know like <laughs> um I think between what it's before this I was leading classes at the Kingsley Association through Yoga Roots on Saturday mornings um and doing some private video sessions and that was cool um since this has been going on, I've been leading meditations with the Allegheny County Bar Association, and that has been... That is so cool. That's Yo, cool. it's fantastic. So meditating. I have literally never heard of this. <laughs> yeah. meditating. They, like, might be... The, this is probably a bad stereotype, but, like, I don't... That's, like, probably one of the last groups of people I would imagine, like, going for the meditation. I'm like, are they fighting you? Are they giving you reason? Like, are they loving it? Like, amazing. <laughs> from what I've heard, it's been like really positive. And like, they're like, I really needed that. I think mm -hmm. lawyers really do get a bad rap. And I think that people don't know how many lawyers live within their communities. And like the amazing work that most of them are doing. Yeah. Um, and so like lawyers take on a lot. Mm -hmm. They take on like, if like, you know, I was working with attorneys in my most recent position who, um, one, who's so like such a good resource um, and was really teaching me a lot. And I was learning a lot from him. He said, you know, I take on, I take on my client stuff. If you can't mm -hmm. sleep, I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. If you can, you know, and so passionate. And, you know, I think people don't realize that's that's a generation that's one generation of lawyers like that's how they move through life mm -hmm. so imagine carrying your stress and the stress of a whole company yeah um 
and then having to deal with the other side of it, which is the perception of lawyers are terrible people and they, you know, like, and that's how people come at you when you're out in society, mm -hmm. that you're a terrible person and like, because that's been their experience with lawyers or that's what people who they care about, that's been their experience. Mm -hmm. So I think I hold a place of, I hold a couple of things in my hands at one time. Mm -hmm. Cause I understand what it means to be inside and I understand what it means to be the person who has been negatively affected by lawyers doing things that hurt people, you know, and one of the things that I am deeply, you know, holding space for right now is just encouraging lawyers to come and come to their truth and to engage in community with each other truthfully. You know, like, and it's really hard because it's a practice of posturing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's performance. Yeah, it's like, yeah, no, 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 I, like, 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 <laughs> I'm right, I'm right. Even though really in your mind, you can right. think of 20 <laughs> reasons why you definitely are not right. But like, I'm gonna do this, mm -hmm. I'm committing. And so what I hope these meditations are, are offering is an opportunity to, even if they're not necessarily expressive, expressing truth, where they need to say it out loud, I hope it gives them space to sit with their truth and to sit with like kind of where they really are, you know, how this is affecting them, things that they can make space to process um, so they can be a service. Mm -hmm. You know, like I say often, if your cup is not full, I promise you, you don't have any more for other people. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a Julia Cameron, um, the artist way lesson that's been deep in my bones for years. You no, know, I really do still have that book and the notebook I didn't start. So maybe now's the time. It's great. Okay. But it's something that, so she talks about, um, replenishing the well, refilling the well. And it's basically saying like, as an artist, you don't have anything to give if you have completely depleted yourself, not just of inspiration or, you know, like your creativity doesn't leave you. It doesn't. But if you deplete yourself emotionally and with stress and even physically, if you're depleting yourself with, you know, abuse of substances, depleting yourself with people who don't pour into you and take more than you can ever give them, and you're not, not setting any boundaries and, you know, whatever, if you're depleting yourself with work, whatever depletes your energy, if that's what you're doing, and you're not doing anything to counteract that. Of course, you don't have time to write, draw, paint, mm -hmm. dance, photograph, cook. What other mediums am I missing? Mom, like whatever it is that you do. Arguably love too. You know, it's funny. I was just talking, you know, when I have like a couple of sessions with people, one of the things that I've been talking about recently, especially during this era of the pandemic is like, are you being curious? And curiosity is creativity, you know? Yes, it is. And it's like, are you being curious? Like, instead of just being like defensive, are you being curious? Like, why is this person responding this way? Why is this person that I live with so fucking scared? Mm -hmm. You know, or whatever. Like, we have to activate that curiosity. But if we're super focused, you know, on, you know, like exactly like you're saying, on so many other things and we're not, we're not able to see clearly. And so that creativity that, which to me is like everything that's ever led me to be creative was because I was curious and everything that made me curious made me creative, <laughs> you know? So you're curious and you felt safe enough to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so much so, of that is how we give that to others. And then also how we give it to ourselves. And that's a lot of it too. It's like realizing like we really cannot want, um, we cannot want for others that we cannot want for ourselves that which we would deny others. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and that's just like, hold up. I have to figure out who said that. Oh, who said that? There's a, there's, I'm like, I need to say who said this. 
<laughs> I don't know who said that. It's I, Ernest, know, I got that from Ernest Holmes. Ernest Holmes. Ernest, Ernest Holmes, Science of the Mind. Um, but yeah, so I just think about all these things and I think about being an artist. I think about being an artist and a lawyer and, and being a yogi. And all three of these things are things that the term we use for them is practice. Mm. My creative practice, my law practice, my yoga practice. Mm -hmm. There is no perfection. Yes. There is no right way to do any of these things. There, is, there are precepts. There are rules that we agree to. There are ethos and ethics that we agree to. And then there is the doing. Mm -hmm. And so I allow these three things to always inform one another. And that has been like, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> it's been amazing to allow that for myself. And what wasn't working before was trying to force myself to pick one. Mm. Why do you it's think it's like so I was gonna learn. to hold that, that? You know, I know Sydney and I face this a lot because what we do, working for yourself, you're always just trying to be like, you, gra you do a lot of things. You do a lot of different things, but you're, mm -hmm. to us, it's the same thing. It's just a lot of different ways that we're getting there. You know, but, you know, I just wonder about that. Like, how do you process that or view that or see that or explain that in your mind? Why it's hard for people to allow space for them to see that we are not just like what our jobs are. Because that's really what we've been told our whole lives, you know? Capitalism. Capitalism is fucked up. Like, I'm so like, like, Thank you. really, really honest. The way I was hoping you would, but. <laughs> <laughs> like, we have to be honest about that. Because once you're able to say, oh, like, so I live in this society where some people only understand other people based on their vocation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as teenagers, actually as children is when it starts. What do you want to be when you grow up? Myself. Like, I cannot wait for a child to look at me and just look me in my face and tell me, I want to be me. What are we talking about? Yeah, I don't even <laughs> know what you look like in 20 years. Leave me alone. <laughs> It's like, how long is, is this year one year? Or we had a month, a day. What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. So I kind of want, like, so I think about that. And then I think about how we change. Mm. And I think about how many of us feel this pressure, because I felt this pressure. When I went into undergrad, I remember really having a very intense moment about what my major was going to be. Mm. And I was a film major. I fought the power. I was like, I'm going to major in mass media arts. I'm making yeah. a film. I wish somebody would say something to me. <laughs> and I wanted to write screenplays. And I just wanted to be a writer. Like, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write. I wanted to be a screenwriter. Um, because I didn't want to have to wear, I wanted to be comfortable. I didn't want to have to wear a suit to work. Like, you have the irony of who I've become. Right. Um, <laughs> 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 and I wanted to write and I wanted to observe like spend time observing people and understanding our experiences and how they affect each other and that just seemed like a great way to be able to do those things um and then while I was in school when I while I was in undergrad I kind of realized I was okay at organizing and producing and I was like oh this is a thing I can organize people and then they can make the thing come to life <laughs> I was like, that speaks to something else in me. Mm -hmm. And so that changed. You know, I, I started to shift my understanding of what I wanted to do. And then I started to realize that, oh, snap. I was like, why aren't there more? I said, there are tons of, uh, there's tons of Black people and Asian people and you know, at this time we, we were saying Latinos and Latinas, but now we say Latinx. <laughs> but yeah. there's tons of people. <laughs> Things change. <laughs> Things change. <laughs> and 
I was like, everybody's making stuff, but I focus my energy on Black people making things, making movies in particular. And I was like, everybody's making stuff, but nobody's getting distribution. Mm, I'm interested in that. You know, and then I was like, well, what's one way to go into that and understand? I was like, well, that's all intellectual property. Oh, I want to learn more about that. Hmm. What does it mean to go to law school? Wow. And then I was like, I don't really want to go to law school, but okay, like, whatever. We'll see what happens. And I went. That's and so dope, then, though. Like, the curiosity, again, mm -hmm. curiosity leads to the creativity to, to, to figure out. How do you even yes. get here? Mm -hmm. But I think it's like, how often do we not change our minds? And how often don't we let ourselves change our minds? Allow for what I would call therapies, therapists call emotional, uh, you know, flexibility. Like just the flexibility of mind mm -hmm. to be able to see all the, oh, there's so many things. You know, once we move away from this, like should, should, you know, all of these things, we you know there's so many things, mm -hmm. so yep. many options. So I'm always like, it's okay to change your mind. I tell everybody, I was like, just okay, change your mind. I changed my mind. And me changing my mind, my change your mind practice has gotten strong. Like, I'm like, nope, I changed my mind. I'm going to just go home. I'll see you later. Like, I'm good. I actually just want to go home and like watch a movie and go to bed. <laughs> it's like, that was nice. Yeah, all those small things, like being able to have that voice, you know, not just going with the, the flow, you know, but really being like, you know, I think I'm done. I remember even, it seems so silly, but even just like the idea of being at a party and like not letting myself go home or being mm -hmm. at, you know, wherever and just like doing things purely because of the way that I thought I was perceived or, you know, I wouldn't be as fun or some, or whatever, right? Or as smart or as whatever the thing is, you know, and how we, we don't allow for that flexibility and that space to fully be ourselves. You know what my favorite part of partying during um, this pandemic is? Being alone. It's not just the being alone. I mean, that's cool. But <laughs> it's the fact that you can literally in one moment be like, ah, 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 that's my jam. Oh, no, that's my jam. Music loud, dancing everywhere, having a great time. And then when that switch hits that I'm done dancing and having listened to loud music, I literally turn the music off. I put on some like <laughs> bells or chimes or something <laughs> instrumental or nothing. I turn the lights off. Like it's like I immediately I can shift gears from what I, from being at the party to being back at home mm -hmm. without thinking twice about it. And it's almost like, whoa, I didn't even have to get in my car to go home. I just said, I'm done. Close close that party up yes <laughs> thank you so much for your time and your amazing musical selections i am ready to read this book so this is how you are caring for yourself during this time of of covid19 i just want you know we have to wrap it up but i really wanted to just kind of get your thoughts on how you're you know how are you doing and um you know, we will be sure, Sydney and I are always sure to make sure that, I just said sure like a hundred times, um, <laughs> uh, to, to post any of the information that Jackie has shared. Mm -hmm. um, also, Jackie shared a phenomenal um, app with us as well that we'll also share mm -hmm. um, in the comments. And, but yeah, just to kind of close it out, what do you really want to say that maybe you haven't said and yeah how are how are you surviving right now what's your final word what's your okay so my final word is this <laughs> a few things i'm gonna try to bullet point it but it might not be a bullet point moment but i've noticed a lot of everybody's dealing with things in a different way and i saw something about like you know everybody's talking about this awakening that's supposed to happen and none of that matters um, if we're still dealing with capitalism and, and white supremacy and what I thought about was people realizing their discomfort is an awakening. And it doesn't mean that the first thing they're going to go do is like, burn this shit down. Like that's not going to be, <laughs> that's not going to be what happens. But what can happen is um, as people begin to recognize their discomfort with what is going on in the world is 
to shift their behavior accordingly. Like people coming into a new understanding isn't something, it's deeply personal. And so I think some of the things that we can all do is spend some time supporting each other's shifts um, because it's, they're not gonna look the same, you know? And it is gonna be a moment of realizing it may have to be a personal moment. This isn't fair to my husband. This isn't fair to me, you know, that finally gets somebody riled up. Mm -hmm. And so don't underestimate that. Um, I'm not staking my whole life on it, but don't underestimate it either, mm -hmm. right? And don't underestimate how that's moving in you. More importantly, don't underestimate your own power and what your awakening can mean for other people. So like I'm staking my life on walking in my values. I'm spending my time understanding my values more fully so I can live them. Mm -hmm. so I can live what I say I believe. I don't want people, I don't need you to ask me what I believe. I want you to be clear on who I am when I die. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I have been really sitting with lately is like, how do I walk this I want people to look at me and ask me questions so I can tell them like this is what I'm doing what you doing also it's not a competition but the other thing <laughs> duality 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 um the other thing is a lot of people toward the beginning of this Alicia Wormsley said this me and she was like if you need anything just ask and that was how we ended our conversation and that is like the best like goodbye have a great day if you need anything just ask like that's what being in community is mm. um and so it's it's not like i'm gonna gather up all this stuff somebody take it it's really asking for what you need and receiving having the capacity to receive in spite of your pride, whatever you need to ask for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's so important too, because we get so much, we talk so much about, you know, not getting what we want, but we don't really reflect on the fact that we're not often even open enough to see that we have it or that it's been offered and we ignored it or that we haven't, been open enough to like I mean I definitely have had friends at certain points in my life who have literally been like you weren't gonna fucking hear me anyway mm. and I'm like damn I'm a bad listener and you know God knows I have trouble with that and I'm, I'm working on it but it's not I'm a bad listener I just I perform I'm gonna I got issues you know what I mean but I wonder you know so much about that all the time you know like how much do we miss because we're not open, you know, we're just not open to receive or to believe that we're worthy of reception. And it's the worthiness. A lot of it, a lot of these things are rooted in worthiness, like people wanting to go back to work because their self-worth is rooted in working. What the hell? I'm sorry. It's just like, so, but you realize if you don't have your health, there will be no work for you to go back to because you won't be able to do things. Mm -hmm. You know, like your humanity is the valuable thing here. Mm -hmm. You inherently breathing in and breathing out are valuable. Mm. And so is every other person who you encounter, every other living being, this planet on Earth Day is valuable. Is today Earth Day? Yes, it is. I was like, it's six o'clock. I didn't even know. Uh -uh. Oh my gosh. Yes, Earth. <laughs> well, you know, Sydney, what were you going to say? Were you going to say something? I was just going to say that I, what well, you were talking about value. And then when you were going through kind of like your story and changes, it was like the different ways that your career path changed because you were like open to this and open to that. Like, you know, you were not just film or just, you know, lawyer or whatever. 
thank you for challenging my perception of lawyers and not meditation, by the way. Appreciate it. Got to think on that one. But like you were like the openness to all the decisions and like you didn't like stop being a filmmaker or stop having that be part of you. You were like, you know, I think the anxiety about switching your career or switching your life is the same anxiety about like you're saying like, I'm not making any money. I need to like make money if I switch and do something I'm passionate about or whatever. Uh, I stopped having value. So I just, anyway, I appreciated that part of your story and then what you're saying about words now, I feel like more to think on. Hey, we have so much to offer. And so mm -hmm. my final thought on COVID and this pandemic and what my prayer is, this is my prayer. All right, let's end on this prayer. Let's pray mm -hmm. together. My prayer is that so often, so rarely, so rarely, do we get to have an experience that all of us are currently experiencing mm -hmm. that is traumatic for all intents and purposes. Therefore, people expect you to be a different person when you come out. Please, everybody, be yourself. Like when we come out on the other side of this, when you come back out the house, my prayer is that we will all be able to be ourselves to be honest and to walk in our truth and see how our lives change and evolve. And how, like, I just want to see that. I want to see us be honest about what we want, about our desires and about how we interact with people. That is my prayer mm -hmm. is that that like, if we can all come back out the house, ready to hold ourselves and to honor ourselves because we are inherently valued. Like that is, that's what I'm praying for right now. Because I like, yeah, it sounds real like a lot, but I just, I hope we can all stop pretending and just, and really live in our truth and see where that gets us. Cause I think our communities will be better for it. I think our lives will be better for it. So that's how I've been navigating y'all. It's been a lot of inside work, but also a lot of walks and chilling with the birds and listening to them sing and doing some yoga and doing some meditation and shaking my behind on the deck outside, pretending I'm at a party. It makes me happy talking to my friends and talking to y'all. And I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. So thanks for this conversation today. Oh my gosh, are you Thank kidding you. me? I always get so, so I, you know, <laughs> It's funny because Jackie is one of my friends that I always feel like it's never fair. Like I'm never given as much as I'm getting, but I'm going to keep trying. And uh, we really are so grateful that you spent this time. And I, I know everybody that hears this will be too. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. thank you all. Need anything, just ask.